walk out into uh, into a big league field for the first time in that first year what was that experience like yeah crazy so fun and like really surreal like i i place they put you up in in minnesota is like you can look out your window you can see the stadium it's like really close you can see into the stadium so i just constantly be like like whoa i'm gonna be out there so i'm in the record books for that even though it's a very obscure one and you won't find it anywhere but I know. So if I were that age right now, 100% would be a YouTuber. 1,000%. Which one do you think you're better at? Fortnite or baseball? Dude. So I went, bought a laptop at Best Buy and then started streaming. I met Tim the Tatman, who was very similar to me in, in, in personality and, and humor and, and all that kind of stuff. And we're the same age. Going to Oakland, I wanted to stay close to home. I mentioned the whole trying to play for the Mariners thing. Conversations happened every single year. It was just so lukewarm and it was really disappointing. It, it really, really was. Um, and then there was always some like lip service given in the middle of the, like that year. I'm like, oh, like, you know, there will be a point when you're like, I just don't worry. Like that happened a couple of times. Uh, I haven't actually, this might be the first time. You're the first one that's going to get the story. Strike three. He turns it loose. Here's the 0-2. And got him. And the A's get the sweep. Welcome back to the Couch GM Podcast. Been looking forward to this episode for a while as I have on the one and only Trevor May. Trevor announced this off season that he is hanging up his cleats and instead grabbing his controller, his mic and his camera and going full time into content creation. Trevor just wrapped up a great nine year MLB career as a relief pitcher with the Minnesota Twins, the New York Mets and the Oakland Athletics. And in this conversation, we dive deep into the journey of his career and looking forward to connecting with him again to create more content as now that he's retired, he can once again become a Mariners fan. I'm excited to announce that I'm officially the newest Baseballism ambassador. Baseballism is the official lifestyle brand of baseball. Go check them out at baseballism.com and use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. Really excited to join their team. I've been a big fan of their products for a while and especially you Mariners fans, go check out that iconic t-shirt of Griffey blowing a bubble or check out that Griffey hat that's behind me on the wall. And if you're thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing, make sure to reach out to myself as I am a mortgage lender during the day. Visit lenderconnorweb.com or reach out directly to the Couch GM to hit a home run with your mortgage financing needs. And with that, let's get into the podcast. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. A bit of a small world. I grew up down here in Ridgefield. You grew up in Kelso, Washington. And yeah. uh, I'd like to kind of start back with your childhood and growing up and how you got into baseball and, and found that love for the game. Yeah. Walk me through your time growing up. I know you're a Mariner fan watching the Mariners. So walk yep. me through that. Um, I, yeah, I grew up in Kelso, Washington. I was born in 1989. So, uh, like that 2001 Mariners team was when I was 12. And that's usually when the, uh, the baseball, uh, the love for baseball is blooming uh, amongst baseball kids. They're kind of making the deci decision that they really like it or they really don't. I feel like um, it takes a lot to get to your to your uh, sixth grade year. So uh, I kind of had decided I was going to stick around, and then that this magical season happened, and it was just uh, it was like a perfect storm and stuff. So um, yeah, yeah, Richfield's like Richfield's like really close for for those of you that don't know. That's like, you're like 20, 25 minutes away. From where yeah. i grew up so we like that's pretty much the same town uh yeah. all those towns i feel like are just one big town uh so yeah that's i mean that's where it kind of not didn't start but uh that's where like the oh this is like i really invest all the investment came and then uh i believe at that time jamie moyer was on the yeah jamie moyer was on the team and uh my dad would always say like you know, I was 12, 13, 14, 15. And then when I was like 14, 15, he would be like, you throw harder than Jamie now. Um, you could play in the big leagues, which at the <laughs> time, like I knew Jamie didn't throw, like he wasn't a hard thrower, but I didn't know like that he was the softest thrower, but like seven miles an hour at the time. Right. So, uh, but that's enough to give you confidence. So that's kind of what watching the Mariners gave me, um, made that dream feel maybe real. And, uh, yeah, but you know, okay, you got King Griffey Jr., you got A Rod, you got uh, Randy Johnson, Ichiro, um, Bay Bruner or Bay Bruner, Edgar, yeah, <laughs> Edgar J Buner, J Buner, uh, and then even like the Richie Sexton years, and uh, you know, uh, um, like that. That was uh, there's a lot of those those guys that I I loved watching Dan Wilson, like uh, John Allerud, like just I was a big like learn all their names and even learn the secondary players and stuff so that's just very much how i am and my brain is and i notice all these details and that has not changed since yeah. so 
Uh, it started there though with those Mariners teams and, um, you know, I still, have, I've always had a soft spot, even, even coming here and playing here. Like I wanted to win in front of my, uh, friends and family, but like, I wasn't super upset if we didn't, uh, kind of thing. Like, yeah. uh, at the end of the day, uh, I have a, I'm going to be like, I'll be going to games all the time now up here. I uh, know I live really close to the stadium with using the old gold card and use a ton. So I'm back to being a Mariners fan, even if I don't necessarily agree with some decisions that their GM makes all the time. Yeah, I'd kind of like to get into eventually, I mean, their off season at some point, you know, it's been a tale of two halves for them. But uh, I mean, going back to, to you and growing up, so it sounds like you were like in the 80s at 14 years old with your fastball. Yeah, yeah oh yeah, 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 I could, uh, I, I was always the hardest thrower. Um, and you probably are aware of this, but like, you know, Kelso is a little bit of our like, our local baseball hub, right? That's where all the fields are and all the tournaments are in Kelso. Yeah. And, or we even had better, a lot better baseball you know, facilities in Longview did usually in like Longview is a bigger area for anyone who doesn't know, which is probably just about everybody. Um, so we have a, there's like a rich baseball kind of tradition there. And, uh, yeah, so grew up, uh, there and I was the hardest thrower kind of in that, in that area. And then in Southwest Washington generally. And then as I got older, it just kind of became apparent, especially like my junior, senior in high school that like, you know, I was thrown against junior college teams and stuff for my travel ball team just dominating them and uh they're just like uh this kid's you know throwing low 90s in the in when you're a senior in high school is not not very well especially then now it's more common but still not that common in washington so yeah. we just don't have many guys throwing that hard because we can only play baseball for like three and a half four months a year so um this is not a hotbed so having a guy throw 90 in high school is is a if you've got one in your league he's a guy you're worried about all the time and i was that guy yeah, absolutely. And then uh, it looks like you signed a letter of intent to go play at UW. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like you probably were recruited pretty early on, and that was a pretty straightforward process. You know, teams were going to watch you play. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, what was that experience like, being able to commit to UW, uh, which might have been the team that you were also a fan of with college football and that type of thing, um, mm -hmm. and, and that process? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a little bit of dream come true again, like, you know where we're from there's not a lot of it's just there's not a lot of guys who go on to play even at the next level let alone you know professionally so just getting d1 uh offers or getting those letters was super exciting to start mm -hmm. and then they just started flooding in but i mean a lot of that comes from like you go travel tournaments and you're just at places and they just get a list of everyone there and send send stuff um i know that now i didn't know that at the time but uh yeah i think i, I there was a point where you know in the spring of like my junior year in high school, um, this is when I, I was already uh, pretty close to, to, cause I'd gone to a between sophomore and junior summer ball summer. I went up to Washington. I was thinking I was throwing like 86, 87 at camp and Ken Knudsen at the time was, it was the head coach. Uh, and he's like this kid, like, and I was kind of gangly and growing fast. You could tell, but I wasn't full grown. I was hard, throwing harder than everyone my age, like a lot harder uh and so the interest was there immediately like he talked to me right after i threw my first inning or whatever and uh we i signed like like a month later like because i didn't want to go that far from home um washington was was is my like that's my dad's call he didn't go there um but like as as d1 schools go washington was definitely his he'd watch them more than washington state uh my sister oh, in my family the only one who's gone to either school is my oldest sister and she went to washington state <laughs> but we're still a washington so family so she she uh she doesn't like she always says none of you went there and i'm like i skipped it okay you can't say <laughs> i did live on campus for two years and my wife is like i met her there so i didn't not have the experience i have a lot of experience at university of washington i feel like i went there at least for a little bit um but yeah that was it was like an effort to stay close to home it was an effort to it, pack 10 uh, pack 12 um was a conference still uh and it was it's a very good sports conference and actually originally stanford was was the school because of academics and um i i was always big on like i wanted to get straight a's and go to stanford um i was valedictorian because of that uh and then it turns out i didn't even like go i it, i got the opportunity to go play baseball at washington i was like oh i go to washington and then that kind of dream ended but i still wanted to be the valedictorian so uh that that kind of all kind of coalesced together and then uh, at the end of the day just none of it really mattered uh did it so <laughs> right. um yeah kind of a crazy thing but yeah that's why we're we're, we're washington family uh, especially this past year was was a really really fun football season too to watch but um yeah made a lot of friends uh i think uh 
when I went on my first, I went on my official visit. I went and watched Tim Linscombe throw against Brandon Morrow, uh, which I think there was, I think Linscombe struck out 17 and Morrow struck out 16 and they both threw complete games. Uh, and yeah. the game went to like the 11th. I've never seen so many stalker guns being raised every pitch. Um, I think there was like three hits until the extra innings. And then the Washington scored like four in the 11th and they, or they, yeah, they walked it off like a three run through and like a bases clearing something or a, a homer. I don't can't even remember. I just remember, uh, Lindsay. But at that time, uh, Elliot Kribbe was, was on the team and now he's the pitching coach, uh, which is alarming, uh, to me because that means I'm old. He's only a couple of years older than me. So, uh, yeah, there you go. There's a little side side story for you. Yeah, that's awesome. My uh, my dad actually went to Kelso High School. My uncles, uh, he, my dad went to UW, and they've what? been huge huge UW fo- football fans. You actually, this is okay. actually pretty. I got to know your like. I need to know your dad's name. I mean, yeah. I don't know so this is kind of crazy. You're... You and your buddies would actually go over to my uncle's place for meals before football games sometimes. He's a big dude, James Webb. Yeah, he's uh, he was the uh, was he he's like the line coach. He was one of the coaches. Yep, yep. So big dude. No, I know James. I know, I know Webb. Uh, I mean, uh, my dad if, is you, if your dad lived in Kelso, yeah, my family knows you. Yeah. Like it's just, that's the way it is. We know everybody. Uh, everyone knows everybody, but yeah, I'm like, we're like fourth generation in the area too. So um, that's crazy. That's yeah. So it's small world. Kind of funny. Yeah. Um, but then, I live, yeah, so, by the way, I live yeah. next door to Pat Himes, who was the head coach at the time. So they they do football okay. dinners there constantly too. I stopped playing when I was a freshman in high school, but like okay. I, the whole team would be over there. Like they they would rotate it. They, a coach had to had to be the be the guy every once in a while. But yeah, that's it's funny. We know the Heinz is really really well. So so yeah, I've I've talked to talked to Web, Weber a lot. Yeah, that's awesome. So then yeah, as you mentioned, you you won valedictorian. You were the state three A player of the year. You guys made it to the state championship. You got second place there. Did you guys play in T-Mobile Park or Safeco at the time? Yeah, it was like the second year they brought that back because it was in the uh, it was in Cheney before that. Okay. So my freshman year, I think they went, or when I was in eighth grade, they went and they played in Cheney. So. And then, did you know that you were going to be drafted pretty early on, or was it just like kind of like a you're full on UW at that point, and then it was just a, a surprise, or what, what was your expectation heading into the draft in 2008? Yeah, the 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 draft is is weird because um, you just kind of go off of like so you have like two team one or two teams that you usually know that are like really high on you because you, you they've been to your house more than everybody else. It was the Cubs yeah. and the Phillies for me, and it turns out it like those two teams were pretty pretty in on me at the end too uh, during the draft. Um, so yeah, like there was a point in the middle of the season, uh, my senior year, where it was like maybe second round, possibly like supplemental first, maybe because I'm you know, projectable at that time, projectable was the thing. Now, like, I, I don't know, honestly, the, uh, if I was the way I was then, and it was done with like all this track man and stuff, um, actually, I don't know. I, I, it's interesting because I wasn't maximized even remotely close though. I think that I would have had, I known the, I would have known the information. My dad's been printing out Tom house, uh, like blog article, blog posts and articles since like 2002 and in a big, two uh two inch three ring binder so like that's the way that we learned anyway so if we had all the tools now we would have i would have had a track man we would have figured out a way to do it or like lease one or something um but if we just went off how i was and just plop plop me in here i don't know if i would have been even they might have said go to college um because it it just wasn't repeatable but i did have ride so that no one knew what it was then uh Mm -hmm. so maybe i did get drafted I, i don't know but it was supposed to be uh you know first second round there was a game, our district championship game. We were undefeated. We were t- like 20, 20 and 0 or 19 and 0 going into the district championship game. We were playing uh, Hudson's Bay, who we had 10 run every single game. We played them. <laughs> and I stayed up till like two in the morning playing World of Warcraft uh, because we had, I had no hit them earlier in the year. Like I, it was fine. And my Vila was down like five miles an hour. Like I was just not, I was so tired. <laughs> Um, I thought I was only going to throw a couple innings too, like, and then it turned out like we needed me, and we got ten run. Uh, we got ten run in our first out, our, our first loss of the year, which made us a second seed out of our league with one loss, uh, or out of our or our, our district, which actually worked out. Um, I think because I think the other side was a little harder, uh, and, the other, and then Hudson Bay got beat twice, and we're we're out, and we, then we <laughs> ten then we ten run like the next three teams we played in the playoffs. So uh, it's one of those things. But yeah, my mom loves to loves to throw snarky little things up like yeah hey, remember when you you dropped into the 
third to fifth round because of that at game because that was my scout day like that's what my okay. my video oh, is so okay. um and i didn't know that and i also don't i still don't really i mean i don't remember what happened in that uh, that wow session but um i think i got something cool i think i got a cool piece of loot so i'll say it was worth <laughs> yeah. it it all yeah. shook out at the end but yeah she always was like yeah i remember you, you know you, you missed out on you could have doubled your 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 bonus and i'm like yeah i could have but i refuse i just don't think that that's productive uh thinking about that so yeah kids don't play wow until two in the morning the night before you buy a district championship game uh, even if you're undefeated right I tend to be the same way, although it was, it was only the show and Call of Duty for sure, staying up way too late. But uh, yeah. so then you get drafted in the fourth round by the Phillies. Um, I, I guess what was that experience like getting the call? And then, you know, after you get that call, are you shipped off to Philadelphia to see the city or is that just first rounders and walk me through the, that first year, I guess. So I was the seventh player picked by the Phillies that year in the fourth. So they had like they had like a first supplemental, second supplemental, and a third supplemental. I don't think they only have first supplemental now, but they had supplementals between those three. So you could do uh, bonus picks there. So, um, yeah, it was like, you know, uh, I'll throw some names at you. Uh, Anthony Goes was ahead of me there. Um, a guy named Jason Knapp, who from Jersey, who's just threw so hard. Jonathan Pettibone, uh, Vance Worley. Um, they all were picked with Zach Collier and Anthony Hewitt. Those are the, So, yeah, those are the six that were picked before me. I think uh, of those guys, I think me and Vance Worley have pretty close to the same amount of service time. I think I might, I might have a little bit more now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I won. <laughs> but no, I wasn't one of those guys. Uh, they didn't bring me out to Philly until um, until I won. I was the Paul or the uh, the I think Paul Owens Award winner in '11. Mm -hmm. Then then I yeah. went to like a game. Was in the booth, pitcher of the year for the organization. Um, that was the i think it was the first time i went there in a like a capacity outside of like i think we did a rookie de yeah we did a rookie development thing too like a year before that where we did like our little we go up to philly and we just like talk to the beat writers and how to like have media media training a little bit okay. which i failed and I, I think i said ass in one of my uh <laughs> interviews um but which is so funny now looking back so yeah not really i i i I knew I, I did a lot of research in the guys that got picked before me. We're all six, five. We're all right-handed. Uh, we all throw low nineties uh, and half the guys were from California. So I was like, Callie's, you know, I'd played, I played against like the ABD Bulldogs, which was call your ghosts, Aaron Hicks and, and Garrett Cole all together yeah. um, twice in two different tournaments. And they just boat raced us both times. Um, we had a good team. We, we were a really good team out of Seattle, but they, they were just, I was our best pitcher and they were, they get call who's our 98 yeah. as an 18 year old so oh, really. uh yeah it was it was a little different um so i knew about them and i knew 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 that i wasn't going to be probably the big priority but i also knew that like you know you not nothing fourth round first guy out of the state that was drafted that year so yeah. even out of college so like you know that means that doesn't mean nothing so uh yeah it was a little bit of a shock though i'll be honest with seeing all the guys being pretty much exactly the same as me we got time to spring training for the first time yeah. So then, I mean, you, you spend five years in the minor leagues working through the system. Uh, you mentioned that you were one of the top prospects for the Phillies. You were the top prospect for the Phillies in 2011, heading into 2012. Um, and then you spent, you know, three years basically as a starter pitching over 130 innings each year. What, what, what were those experiences like throughout the minor leagues and pitching full seasons, you know, as a starting pitcher? Did you know that you were going to be trending up um, at some point or was it just kind of going out there and doing what you can each day. Cause I mean, at the time the Phillies had Cole Hamels, Roy Halladay and Cliff Lee, oh, yeah. you know? So yeah. What, what yeah. was that experience? We're just hoping like, you know, to take Blanton or uh, Kyle Kendrick's spot mostly. Uh, yeah. It, it was, yeah. The big leagues were very much put on a pedestal in Philly that year. Then they win the world series the first year I'm there. So like <laughs> we're dealing with that. Um, but like the big reason they drafted me is actually because Pat Gillick is from up here uh, and he was the GM at the time. So he got to see me a lot. And his like right hand pitching guy, Charlie Kerfeld, also lives in Seattle. So like they they both got just a bun bunch of time with me. So I feel like I got a little bit of a local bias from them, uh, which I'll take. Uh, you can yeah. get take it where you can get it. Um, so but yeah, it, it, going through the minors, five first of all, five years is just unheard of. Even high school kids are like, if you're good, if you're like if they see you as part of their big league team, you're you're up in three if you're ready or you're not ready, like you're going to learn some stuff up there. There's just certain amounts of certain things you need to learn at the big league level. 
uh, that you can't learn anymore in the minors. So, right. um, you know, I, I had, I had a quite the roller coaster and, and I know that, um, a lot of it has to do with this, me, like making things bigger in my own head than they are. That's just something I've always done, dealt with, you know, I, the anxiety stuff's all public now and all kind of stuff. So it, it was very much there and that, that, that it was going to be a slower road for me, no matter what, um, I was going to have to make big changes regularly and it took a while to learn how to do that. But once I did, um, it sped up really like in 2013, right at the end of 2013, something clicked and then taken into 14, 14, I was just like nails and just big leaks. So like, um, after never really being good at double A. So yeah, it was definitely like a, I'm going to play a full year at this level. So let's just do our best and let's, let's, uh, honestly, like, you know, it's like, let's go play just good enough to miss the playoffs by half a game. Like that's basically <laughs> what it is in the minors because the playoffs is like, you don't get paid anymore. And you just play for an extra year. You're, you're, you have to play baseball for an extra 10 days, which sucks. Cause it's been a long year. So yeah. my goal was always just throw as many innings as I could and stay healthy. And I did that really well in the minors. I think I threw, um, 150 something innings, like three times, which an another thing that's just unheard of. I have 900 minor league innings. Like, yeah that doesn't exist yeah. it's a whole career that doesn't exist we like mason miller came up last year with the uh with the ac had 27 two-thirds innings in the minors man he'd been hurt so he's electric let's yeah. be i'm gonna be very clear I'm the gassed. kid can pitch in the big leagues but i'm like dude you have not done I, I pitched more innings in my rookie year in rookie ball when they're super limiting after i just played a, a high school season of through 70 innings in high school so <laughs> it's I was always a workhorse. That was the point. Um, and, uh, but that's just not, I missed, I was early. I was early. Um, I think I would have had, I would have people, they would have liked me a lot more as a starter. I think now than they, yeah. than they did at the time for sure. And so it sounds like you made some adjustments in double a that made the difference and, and, and allowed you to take that jump the next year. It wasn't necessarily like an opportunity opening up. It was more so, or was it a combination of both to where you uh, learned a little combination. Stuff? Yep. Yeah, they so you can they can move you all the way. It's like AAA is where you're gonna get stuck if there's people above you. It's like, it's it's it really is because they can shift they can shift things around where you're like you're not necessarily competing directly against a guy at one level above you or he needs to go before you can go. That's not really how the miners work. Uh, you could be on the same team, you could like overlap because there's other spots, especially when you're starting pitcher. So it's not so much like that as it is for like a position player. Like I'm a third baseman, you have to have the third baseman vacate for yeah. you to get there. Um, so that's why guys switch positions all the time to get opportunities. And yeah, it's, you know, they were really good. Um, but as we got really close, like R the Ruben Amaro era kind of was getting towards its end where, you know, he was kind of just making bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. Um, and the team was getting, going uh, less far into the playoffs every year until eventually they got knocked out and he got fired. Uh, and I was like one of his last trades. So, and he also traded all my teammates. So I, I just like saw that coming too. So I don't know. You have this underlying, like, you know, I'm a big leaguer. I'm going to pitch at the big league level. It's just a matter of when, and uh, the opportunity does have to be there. So there is, a, there's a lot of that. And when you're with a team like that, you try to hold on to that glory of like having that big core of all those big stars, like the Jimmy Rollins and the Ryan Howards. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, sometimes it's kind of slow to move on, and that's that kind of happened to them a little bit. I think, uh, at least in the pitching side, I, I think those the core of hitters and stuff was you know, they were good the whole time until, you know, worth left and, and stuff. And, uh, so, but then the pitching side, yeah, it was like, there were just wasn't a lot of opportunity. So there's part of, part of me being excited about being traded because maybe there's more opportunity at the other place. Yeah, absolutely. And then I, I just watched your uh, video recently of you watching back your MLB debut in August, 2014 in Oakland. Yeah. yeah I mean, a little bit of a rough outing there, but walk me through that first year and your okay. first experience, you know, you, you, walk out into onto a big league field for the first time in that first year what was that experience like uh yeah crazy so fun and like really really um surreal like i i the place they put you up in in minnesota is like you look out your window you can see the stadium it's like really close you can see into the stadium and uh so i just constantly be like like whoa i'm gonna be out there <laughs> um and then you know oakland call seems massive and they, their fans are pretty pretty rabid um which is why i wanted to go there which in the best in the best uh way possible rabid fans and the team was really good they had josh johnson they were going to be a playoff team um they just traded for smarja who i started against uh so thank god there was no cespedes anymore i think that my debut would have been being even worse um but you know i won't trade it for a world i think it's a great story now 
Uh, I think I learned a lot, and I never pitched that bad again. That was the worst outing of my career, and it was my first one. That's that's ideal. That means you got yep. better the whole time. So, yeah, that first year was like team was out of it. There wasn't a lot of like, I'll be honest, very, very laid back uh, group of veterans, like very laid back. Um, you know, uh, Willingham, uh, Pelfrey, you know, like Kevin Correa, Ricky Nolat. Like these guys are just like playing golden tea in the, in the locker room and just playing catch and like going out and doing what, doing what they do. Like it wasn't, you know, Glenn Perkins, like he's just chilling. Phil Hughes chilling. Like they're all just, I think Phil actually came the next year, but uh, everyone's just chilling. So um, there wasn't a lot of like, you know, light a fire under the rookie. It was more like you shut up rookie. So I did. And uh, it's hard to kind of get comfortable in a situation that way. Um, but I think that they warmed up to me in 15. Not that they were like cold. It was just like, you know, they're not going to make a big effort because that's just not what you do. You, that's part of like the tradition of it. So I kind of had to work through things. I had to like make the make things matter, like in terms in a scope of like the games really mattering because we were out of it. We're 20 games under 500. No one else in our division except for, you know, the Tigers and the Royals were even really that competitive. So like I, I had to like create this. It was a big deal to me because it's the big leagues. But you have to kind of create this like this game matters. To my career even though it doesn't matter in the right. scope of things and no one else seems to care not that they don't care not just there, there's no no one else seems to have a huge sense of urgency at the moment because why would they it's towards the end of the year they're already being paid they're all older like it's just the way it is so uh i tried to i had to do that kind of find ways to do that um and it took me a while it took me seven or eight outings before i was like you got to get through like we got to get through five and start like noticing when things are flipping on you and then this sticking with the course and uh and there's an there's an outing i've talked about i think i talked about it in that video uh maybe possibly i don't know but it, i've talked about it before there was an outing against the white Sox and matched up with sale and we hung we hung some runs on on him uh, early like four runs in the second inning or something and we had a lead so i started to kind of get in trouble in the third and the fourth because you know and the guy started scoring it was four two and there was a conversation that happened with me trevor ploof and the pitching coach uh uh anderson who's also from up here. Um, and uh, we just had to find a way to get through it and like buckle down, just like go somewhere else, go somewhere, go somewhere deeper. That's a little bit more competitive here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that place and then I used that place for the rest of my career. So that's when things changed. I think it threw six innings that day, struck out 10, 10 strikeout game in the big leagues is a big deal, especially oh, yeah. now it's a bit, it doesn't happen that much anymore. So I'm glad I have one of those. And then I think my last outing was against the Tigers and I threw out like eight and six innings. We didn't win, but you know, quality start six innings, three runs. And that lineup was insane. Like they were really, really good that year and they went really deep and they went to the world series. So, uh, or no, no, sorry. They got to beat, um, 12, they went to world series, but you know, Royals did. So we had a good division doing against those teams, big deal. So that was kind of a, uh, took that in the off season and then, got ready for my sophomore year, which went way better. Yeah. So, and then 2015, you started 16 games. Um, you pitched in 48 games total that year. So at some point you made a transition to the bullpen and yeah. yes. what was, um, who made that decision, you know, um, and what was that experience like? Urban Santana was on an 80 game suspension for uh, PEDs. He was coming back like right after the all-star break or right, bef maybe right before the all-star break. And at the time, it was um, in the rotation because we had some injuries. Nick in Alaska, the reason I got up in Alaska got hurt like the second day of the season. And, uh, it, you know, it was like a an weird ankle ligament thing. So we had no idea when he was coming back. So at the time, it was me, Mike Pel There's two spots for me, Mike Pelfrey, and Tommy Malone. So at the time, Tommy was throwing really, really well. Like, he'd given up like three runs his last like 40, and he, like something great like he like five straight outings of of seven innings and uh, two runs or less like really good change was good not walking anybody uh looked like a pro but you know he's tommy you know you you're well acquainted i'm sure he's had a couple stints with the uh, mariners now rainier hall hey, of yeah rainier hall oh yeah he's he's a triple a cy young award winner that guy was because when they sent him down because he was with the uh twins at the time when he was in triple a that year because he was he was throwing eight shot eight every day Every time he pitched, wow. he just owns those leagues because of his changeup. Like he's yeah. such guys with command like that just are so good in AAA. So um, his command was impeccable. He's a really good friend of mine too. So like, uh, um, you know, I was happy he was up there too. And I was, I can't argue with you. Like he deserves. So one of those was going to be him. So it was down to be me and Pelf. Pelf was throwing well, fairly well too. He was having a good bounce back year. But he had been struggling a little bit lately, but he was making, you know, 9 million, 10 million a year. 
and uh, it takes him literally an hour to warm up. So they're like, we can't, we can't, we can't put Pelfrey in the bullpen. So basically called me in. Paul Mahler was like, Hey, we can't put Pelfrey in the pen. And Tommy's throwing really well. And also Tommy doesn't really profile. Them. These guys are long relief guys. We think that you yeah. might be able to do something a little bit more active. And I'm like, okay. So I'm hearing, I'm not going to the minors, which is all I wanted to hear. You could have said, Hey, we're going to keep you on as a clubhouse staff. And just like, <laughs> if there's a spotlight, I would have been like, okay, I don't care. I'm not going, I'm just don't send me to Rochester. So I got to go to the pen. Uh, Glenn Perkins got hurt like immediately. So Kevin Jepson was, became the closer. Um, Casey Fiend was setting up at the time. Uh, I think Casey had something go on or like struggled a little bit. And uh, I added like three or four miles an hour to the velo. So I was throwing, you know, 92, 93 as a starter. And then suddenly I'm throwing 95, 97. And they're like, do you want to set up? And then by the end of the year, I was setting up with, with, with Jet. And we were close to playoff team. We were 80 three wins or something that year 84 so we were just we got eliminated like three days left in the season um so yeah things were going well and they used me in that role and i finished the year strong and i think that i'm, I'm actually very certain that that year the two guys me and adam warren both did for the first time ever in the history of baseball 15 starts plus and 30 plus out of the pen in a, in a regular season and then uh, in 2017 we both had tommy john so that's probably related um yeah yeah so i'm in the record books for that even though it's a very obscure one and you won't find it anywhere but i know so <laughs> that's yeah that's a cool stat um yeah i mean and then 2016 it leads to you know you end your season with a stretch fracture in your back and then 2017 you have a, a tear in your ucl so do you think that was correlated with that transition back and forth to both of those injuries yeah a little bit um also you got to learn like the routines are just completely different. Like how do yeah. you save energy and how do you maintain your body as a reliever? So I had to learn that. Um, it wasn't hard for me to pick up. I think preparing mentally to pitch. I liked that part. Um, but yeah, learning, learning how to keep myself um, healthy as uh, every day was, was, was the goal that off season and coming back, it was like, I did a, I did some, I did a Pilates routine and like, uh, so my back felt better coming out for 16. Yeah, that was a long, that was a really kind of weird situation where it kept getting mi misdiagnosed. Uh, I had to kind of go search for my own, like a bone specialist. And then mm -hmm. a stress reaction is like something you can't catch without a, without a bone scan. Like you have to get yeah. a bone scan. And that's just not something that, pe that baseball n normally does. I literally had to do it also in New York. With my stress reaction in my arm. Um, I'd be like, guys, bone scan. Seen this movie. And then we did it and it was bad so um i'm glad that i had the back thing or i wouldn't have found the arm thing and i might have really really hurt myself so yeah they were correlated tommy john was a freak thing came right like it just completely evolved just came off the, the bone clean like a yeah. like a seam of a shirt so like my doctor dr uh keith meister who's the man uh who i think does the best job in the in the business now he uh he was like yeah i just put it back on and then put your other one like, because you get a, another ligament out of your body and put, on, you put the other one on top. So he's like, if you tear that again, I don't know what to tell you. Isn't that kind of best uh, case, having it be a clean tear? Yeah, that's the best. Um, yeah, best yeah. case is like clean, like, because you get in there and you don't know fully until you see it. Um, and he said, there's no, he, up in that point, he's like, that was, it was like rolled, it was almost like, he's like, it was like rolled up like a nice piece of newspaper or a ro uh, <laughs> magazine. It took like one minute to get it in position. And sometimes it's like kind of messy. And mine was the opposite. It was as clean as it could be. So, which tells me, I just threw a pitch weird, like yeah. just one time, whatever. I, maybe I wasn't as in shape as I need to be long toss wise because of my back. And I was still kind of like iffy and trying to make sure it's okay. So I can be healthy. Yeah. Um, that could have been it. We don't know, but um, it, it seems like a freak thing. And I've had zero issues with my elbow since and none before. So it's just a weird, weird thing. But yeah, I think that the, the constant flip-flopping was, was not the best for uh, learning as a young guy, how to stay healthy for 162 games. Yeah. And then on the same uh, time frame, 2016, you started streaming on Twitch. 2017, it looks like you signed with a Canadian professional esports organization. Yeah. So, yeah, walk me through how you got initially into wanting to get into streaming, creating content. So I've always been like, like this kind of stuff. Um, I think that, you know, I'm a little older than Advent of YouTube. Um, like, you know, I, 2005, six, seven, it was early and we used it a lot. The kids did, but you know, there was no, like, we didn't even, iPhones didn't exist. 
Like right. there's no way to watch on your phone. So like it wasn't near as big. And so it was very much like a, like a, like a blog. I didn't have time at school I had whatever, but had I, if I were that age right now, 100% would be a YouTuber thousand percent. Um, because I've just, I did all the, I did all the skits in high school, all the class competitions. I was class president. Like I liked putting on like events and shows and like, I could have been a theater kid if I wasn't in sports, hundred percent. I would try to acting like it was just something I liked. I, I've always loved movies. I've always loved TV. Um, I like stand up comedy. There's, I've dabbled in everything in prop. So it just makes sense. And then I had that injury. Um, I wasn't traveling with the team. Couldn't really figure out what was going on. Overwatch had just been released. I always had my PS4 with me to take it on the road sometimes. So I was like, I'll play Overwatch. I liked it a lot. Realized very quickly that PC was the way to go. I, I've always been a PC gamer, honestly. PS4 was kind of weird. It was just portable. So I went and bought a laptop at Best Buy and Alienware um, yeah. and then started streaming. And then I, I met Tim the Tatman, who was very similar to me in, in, in like personality and, and humor and, and all kinds of stuff. And we're the same age. Uh, and so I was like, there's a lot there. And he likes sports. So um, I was one of the early athletes on the platform. So I, there was a way to grow. And like I could use the, hey, I'm a major league player as a in for a lot of things. And I'm not shy. That, that happened. I did that yeah. on purpose uh, because why wouldn't you? and uh and made some connections that way and like made connected with people like on a human level and then yeah just made the friends and we just kept playing and playing and then Fortnite happened and that's when um honestly i couldn't play with tim overwatch he was just higher ranked and to be honest he was getting carried to top 500 and so i, I there was no spot for me because i'm not even as good as he is so like yeah. you had to be better than tim to play with him that was the way the game played the game yeah. was and so finally Fortnite came out and it didn't really matter. And there was the ranks didn't matter. You could play with it, whatever. And it was all about just joking around and, you know, winning's great, but doing funny stuff. And I think, right. he, I think they all realized that I had that, you know, in the real time visceral reaction thing going on. So, uh, sure. I got, I just made the friends and now they've all become lifelong friends. Like I talk to them and hang out with all these people. Extreme talk your disrespect. So uh doc doc is not someone that i've spoken to a lot i've played with him a couple times same with mercs uh like twice maybe i think once once or twice just because they're very meeting new people like they're not they're not meeting new people often yeah they got their they got their crews and uh like nick takes things very seriously he jokes around a lot but he like he do play the game the right way and so there's not a lot of patience there and then doc's like just he tries to keep a layer of separation between him and everyone but the people he's really comfortable with so yeah. i if, if you haven't noticed if anyone's watched doc recently there's very few new people he's played with in the last three years like nobody's new it's all people he already knows uh and you know i'll chalk it up to that but it's weird because though both those guys like sports a lot i thought i'd be i thought i would have a i thought it would land even better with them but yeah uh, i I, th I think i'm under the i think i think what's really happening is they don't really consider baseball a sport um, <laughs> you know it's they're, not it's not mma football. football or basketball so yeah, yeah. <laughs> should have yeah. did that, I guess. So uh, have you played in like esports tournaments and all that stuff? Are you still doing that stuff? The tournaments? Uh, yeah. I mean, I played in some stuff. I played in some uh, Twitch rivals. I've done some, uh, did a couple, I did a Fortnite tournament land once, um, which did not go well because I didn't bring my own peripherals and the, things with, I don't know if you play much uh, PC gaming, but um, if you do, people know about like how dialed in desk height, keyboard, monitor height, all this stuff that changes when you're different angles and stuff. It could throw everything off little, a little bit. And like, you're just, you went from good to terrible. Um, or if you're not used to the frame rate or whatever, if it's slower yeah, right. or faster, like your reaction speeds are, are tailored to what you have. And that's the nice thing about controllers is like, you just plug it in and make a couple adjustments and it's the same everywhere. Uh, so that was, something that i was like oh my god i didn't even plan for any of this i just was whatever so i barely did anything but um i've done some tournaments myself i've done some commentating myself i've gone to a few live events i went to like a couple overwatch world cups which was look intense yeah. yeah oh dude it was it was a good time especially when it's like the countries oh it's it's really really cool um yeah i think it's i think it's great i tried to make a foray into that doing some analytics tried to start a company uh but you know it very clearly became it became clear to me very fast that there's no way I'm going to be able to build or run a company when I'm playing baseball. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, for sure. I mean, 162 games, you're playing six months out of the year. Yeah, to, yep. to try to add anything on top of that. 
no chance. Um, uh, getting back into baseball. So, you know, 2019, 2020 happened. You're still with the twins. If you want to walk through some of the, what those experiences with those years were like, and then after 2020, you end up, you know, wanting to sign with the, uh, the Mets. So, you know, why the Mets, what was that process like? Yeah. Um, 19 was one of the most fun years I've ever played baseball, watching all the homers. Um, but I think 19 was the first year where I started to see like how, how the league was going to progress with like what, how they were going to shape it to be the way they wanted it to be with how Rob was going to go about that. And, uh, that's when I started to get really, really start to notice all the little like shady half truths and dishonest things and things that were like, uh, we didn't know about that. So like the ball, it started with the juice balls and the lies about that. And then, then of course, two years later, they're like, actually they were juiced. Yeah, we know. We told you that. Um, we told you that and you lied to us and now you're cool. Now it's fine. Cause you're telling us, okay. So that's the first thing that happened. And then, uh, next year is the COVID thing. And then we're having conversation. We're, we're like, we're having this public d- debate about, you know, how many games can we come back? How we get, and it just turns out that the guy was going to make it 60, no matter what we did. So it's like, it just, yeah. So I got very jaded, uh, yeah. there and then I started to be more active um so that was a weird year from that standpoint just like what are we doing and then secondly um yeah it was it was an odd year because of the shortened season but like I I streamed constantly when we were waiting for the season to start and stuff so like it wasn't all bad but yeah it was weird I was in Minnesota the whole time waiting um because they didn't want me to fly back here because it was a hotbed at the time when it first broke that's what they call called it a hotbed just right. anywhere that that had a lot of like uh traffic from Asia basically yeah like San Francisco was too the whole west coast was so they were like we don't think we want you we we don't know if it's you know we don't want you to go take the chance I'm like well okay I'll I'll go up we have an apartment so hung out there and then then I signed with the Mets after that so had a good year though um the no fans was weird but it was also wasn't that hard to get used to um it just felt like it went by really fast I mean it was two months so it goes by super duper fast especially when you're only in your own division so uh you're not really traveling very much so, but yeah, yeah, it was a good year. And then, uh, going to New York that behind that process, going to free agency is weird. You get calls like in the first week that they can happen and everyone's just feeling feelers, feelers, feelers. We heard from like 15 teams like, Hey, so what, what are you guys looking for? And then, uh, but it was after the COVID. So there was a lot of like, Ooh, we don't know how much money we're going to have because everyone didn't make as much money as they wanted to make. Yeah. So uh, I had to deal with that. A new two-year deal was the only thing in, uh, on the table, really, because maximum, because Liam Hendricks was the only one going to sign a multi, uh, a real one, and everyone else signed ones. So uh, I knew that going in. And then the Mets just came in hot. Like we said, a number. They came in above that number. They were the only team to go above that number. Everyone else gave the basic one, and we started there. And then we tried to get people betting against each other, namely the Mariners. I really wanted to go to the Mariners. I, yeah. I he, My agent was like, probably not gonna happen you're too expensive <laughs> they, they just they don't sign relievers which has been very clear um but it's turning into nobody signs relievers now so i i'm glad that at least i i got in before it it's kind of dried up um almost unless you you're the angels for some reason uh no one signs any relievers to multi multi-year deals um so it was crazy it happened on thanksgiving uh they called the day before thanksgiving and we just went and it was terrifying because new york's a big big thing like a bigger than life you hear stories right which a lot of them are true uh but not in the way that you think they are uh but it is a unique beast so i I didn't know i didn't know if that's something that i truly truly wanted but um then i saw it as an opportunity so decided to go there um they got a new owner they got a lot of stuff to be excited about and then you know getting lindor getting like they did a bunch of cool stuff that was like okay i want to be part of this and also it's not going to all be on me that was one big i'm like if I'm the big sign for a team. Yeah. Like, so like I was okay with that too. Like the, you know, you don't want all the, you don't want it all to be on you, whether you lose or or not going into a season. That's just not, that's not, I'm just, that's not the type of player or person that I am. Um, though I do want to be part of the, the the crew that does get the job done, you know, being a, being a, you know, being a star that's going to be a multi-year all-star or whatever, just probably wasn't in the cards because it wasn't a closer. So I was just trying to be, there and contributing without being in the spotlight all the time and that was that was uh probably my best solution there um and i i, I loved i liked it there a lot i like the i love the organization i love all the people who work there um you know i i think they're on the up and up and uh but yeah it's crazy 
It happens fast too. Last year also, I had a I had an offer that happened quick, ha- happened so fast that I had to be like, yeah. I got to back away. I got I, I, I went backing away. I said I, my agent. I kind of left him out to dry. He was. I kind of backed away without telling him. I was like, "Hey, man, I got to back away." And he's like, "Hey, you got to tell me that earlier so I don't just ghost the team." Uh, so because you're hurting my, you know, my relationship. He didn't say those words, but I know that's what I did. Uh, so I learned my lesson and I said, Hey, I need to take some time. I was holding out for Mariners. And I think we all know how that played out. Yeah. Um, yeah. You playing with the Mets, you got Edwin Diaz closing it out in 22. Um, yeah. What was it playing? What was it like playing for the Mets, you know, being in the bullpen with some of those guys, that team was solid as a whole. And then, yeah, if you do want to get into last off season, I know you did want to play for the Mariners, play for your hometown team. Walk me through that process. And, you know, you end up signing with Oakland. Uh, in one of your videos, you mentioned that it's mainly to try to stay close to home because you've always been yeah. spring training in Florida, away from your family, all, all those things. So, yeah, walk me through those couple years in, in with the Mets and then moving into the, this prior offseason. Yeah, the uh, couple years with the Mets, uh, that's, your fir- that's your first free agent contract. You want to, like, you basically, when you get to the big leagues, you just point towards you know, where is my best opportunity to make the most money that I'm going to make in my career? Get, let me get there. How am I going to get there? I'm a reliever. Extension is not going to happen. It's just, especially the twins. They're not going to extend a reliever. They're going to extend one guy every couple of years um, who is a position player. And that's just, you know, financially, that makes more sense. I understand. Yeah. I, there's no hard feelings at all. I just, I, I wish that I was a starter kind of, because that might get you extended. But at the same time, like I also loved relieving. So just what came along with it uh and so uh, yeah i went there um uh you know made the most money i'd made and made more than i made my whole career i tripled my my career earnings in the first year because <laughs> i didn't make any money i made like four and a half million dollars my first six years which is a lot of money generally but yeah. if you don't average one million dollars a year for your first six years like that's yeah. really low because now the the minimum wage is 780 so it's like right. it's almost hard to do um and it just so happened to be that way. So I, I, I got a good deal. I, I maximized that. I got some of my incentives too, which, which I'm proud of. Um, so it, it was, it was a, quite the ride though. Learned a lot about, you know, what it takes to be successful and what like not being successful looks like in New York um, with that 77, 85 season 21, which I thought we were a good team. I thought like a, a lot of guys put up good years too. Sugar, mm-hmm. Sugar had a really good year that year, a solid year. It's just our ERAs were like low threes. And everyone's like, oh, that's terrible. It's not. Uh, it's yeah. really not. Uh, and the, the balls were still kind of, the balls were like, are these juice? It was like half and half. We I mean, you're tell. playing in New York. Those are primetime games. They're probably going to be And New York primetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're Sunday night baseball every freaking week. Like, we yeah. never had a day game getaway day anywhere. Like, it was always traveling across the country. It was all, there's just a lot that comes along with it. And then, the you know, the media. There's 50 people in there. Five of them are, aren't interested in truth or anything. They're interested in getting people to read their New York Post article. Yeah, I know. I just called them out. But, like, yeah, those, so there's some guys that you just have to be aware of. They're right. going to take what you say out of as much context as possible in order to get themselves, you know, the clicks. And uh, s- there's people who are just have no shame about it. Most of them were awesome. I really liked yeah. seeing them. There was just a couple that weren't. And that wasn't the case. And that's not the case really anywhere but, like, the big four, Boston, uh, New York, both New York teams, and, like, Philly. Like, other than that, though, everyone LA? else is – even L.A. L.A. is laid back. Okay. They really are. Like, they – you know, you can do no wrong. Like, in terms of the media, they're just not – so the East Coast it's just, mainly, it's any it's a Northeast like thing. Yeah. It's just, but you know they'll they'll yeah. own it. They'll be like, that's very much our personality. Just blunt, bold, loud. You know, uh, sometimes obnoxious. Like they and they they lean into it. That's just the way. Like this, yeah. if you want something, just you know, say it and get it. Like, and I can respect that too. You just you, you just try to avoid them sometimes. That's just and so you had to you get. Have your I, guard I, had up, to get I, I imagine as a player, yeah. Yeah, it, it's hard. It's like it takes a lot of effort. And sometimes you're just like, I'm tired, man. Sorry, I suck. My bad. Uh, but I remember I struggled my first outing. And that's, I came in with that mindset. Like, I do not want to talk to you guys today. And I didn't think it would be this soon. And I'm embarrassed. And as soon as I did that, I think people were like, oh, whoa. Okay. He, okay. He, he gets how we're feeling. He yeah. gets how we're feeling. Of course I do. I'm playing. But um, so I had to de- I had to learn. I had to learn a little bit on like, how to manage uh feeling like you're you're being you know people don't like you um and 
everyone wants to be liked. I realized that I like to be liked a lot, maybe more than other people sometimes. So yeah, it was a learning experience, but I don't regret one moment of it. Um, and I have nothing but fond, fond memories of everyone I interacted with in person, every single person. I didn't have any weird, anything. Uh, people were very, very like the people who were diehard were diehard and they loved to talk to you. And, uh, even with the heckling and the booing and whatever that happens sometimes, like it was always, I don't know, kind of like it was it never felt super personal. So that's, they do, yeah, that was, it was good about that, but I had to learn what that was and that was on me. So there were difficult times. I'm not gonna lie. Um, there were times where I really, really hated what was going on. I, but then I realized that that was a lot of inside of here and not really real. So once I realized that things got much better, it was easy to buy into. Um, and then going to, going to Oakland, I wanted to stay close to home. I mentioned the whole trying to play for the Mariners thing. Conversations happened every single year. It was just so lukewarm and it was really disappointing. It it really, really was. Um, and then there was always some like lip service given in the middle of the, like that year. I'm like, oh, like, you know, there will be a point when you're like, I just don't want to like that happened a couple of times. Some people during the season. Who, yeah, oh, just like just rumblings, you know, conversations your agent has with people or whatever. Like people say office. little things yeah. like, we really like that guy. Yeah. And then nothing happens when the time comes. Uh that got old quick um but that's you know that's when i that's kind of the one of the last pieces that stacked on when i before i went on the rant with uh about ownership um there's a lot of like shoulder shrugging and like passing off blame some to some you know uh myth like mysterious other person all the time a lot of people saying, "Well, I don't know. I can't do anything. It's guys about like uh, who? I can't tell you." So uh, that is, I think that's in every company, everywhere. But that just, that just like graded on me, graded, graded me down to a nub. Um, yeah. So I, uh, I just kind of took took it in stride this last year, and uh, uh, just took took that energy with me to the to the A's because I knew it was out coming to an end, and uh, that was just I felt free for real um playing for this team and i had such a good time uh and big shout out to like you know katze and all the staff like just doing their best like really 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 like feeling what we're feeling and being being with us um and uh you know feeling for david force and and the the executives that like i don't know for certain but that i don't think have that much communication with the, with the people above them for whatever reason so i can imagine how hard it is to do your job effectively so uh shout out to them for doing it and uh all the fans it's like i love the coliseum even though there's duct tape everywhere and like yeah. some of the stairs are duct tape it's just part of it and it's harmless there's a it's a lot of like stuff that's really not a big deal at all it's just it it when you look when you notice all of it you're like wow like this it's like we're in a broken down warehouse but like <laughs> It doesn't really affect you that much. Uh, there's a few things that like they don't have that other teams have in terms of equipment or in terms of space. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I just was like, yeah, it's a little annoying, but is it easy to work around? It really is. Uh, I'm not dependent on any of these things. You got the basics. So uh, I loved it. I love those guys. I love everyone who works at the park. I love all the security guards. Shout out to the security guard crew. You know, at the Coliseum, there's about... 500 of them and they've all been there for like three decades and they're just doing doing the doing the doing god's work and uh yeah. you know i wish i could give them their donuts because i used to bring them donuts uh that i made so i'm gonna yeah. miss doing that this year but uh hopefully maybe i can get down sneak into a game if they'll let me in there you go and uh give them some donuts i don't know and then how fitting was it that you closed out the reverse boycott game yeah that just lined up to be honest at that time we had discussed so it's so funny. Uh, uh, I haven't actually, this might be the first time you're the first one is going to get the story. There we go. So I actually had a conversation with Katze. So I said, I had a thing going. So I had the anxiety thing. So I had some real conversations with him. Like, Hey, like in, in the, in games, like I need to, I need to make some adjustments here and it's going to be easier for me if I can count on like uh, a role that is a little bit, not so rigid at the back end of the pen just for just for a cup like just let me let me get you let me see if this these things i'm doing for the clock because the clock was bothering me um okay. a lot uh see if these things i'm doing are going to work well 
and I threw once in the Mar- at the Mariners. And then the next time I came in, it was in like leverage after JP Sears just threw five innings kind of for in 59 pitches. And we were like, I'm like, oh, well, now we have a one run lead and I'm in leverage again immediately. So like I got one outing and then I'm back into leverage. And I went out and I hit a couple guys, I think. Or no, no, no. I hit the guys the first time. And then I gave the I gave a homer to Ty France to tie the game. Then I shoved. So I, something that that something flipped. And then yeah. that's when I realized the clock. I figured out a way to to deal with the clock and and go to that place really quickly that I learned in 2014. Um, and that was like I felt empowered. Like that's when I felt clicking happen. And then I said, hey, I go, and he goes, hey, he called me in the office. He goes, hey, I know I threw you in leverage. He goes, but I have to be honest. I don't, we don't really have, like, you have, we have the best chance to win games when you, when you're throwing in these, like, it's just the way that, like, I have to try to win the game. And like, and I'm like, you know what? I can do it. You know what? If I struggle, I struggle and we'll, I'll, I'll, but I will figure it out eventually. And I said that. And, uh, um, so we get home. We have the first game against, Tampa, we win by a, a a good amount, and then he goes. He he says something to me. He goes offhand. He goes. He goes. What do you like? If if the situation comes up, we close. I'm like, let's just do it. Like I'm just tired of like worrying about this. Let's just do it. Yeah. He goes. All right. And that night, two one. The best team in the league at the time, who had just destroyed us at their place, um, but we're on a six game win. It just it was just like perfect storm. Six game winning streak. Uh, like we like we're doubling our wins. At this time, I think we at the beginning of that we were twelve and fifty, so oh, we end word. that streak at nineteen and fifty. So like we're riding high, and we're still thirty-one games under five hundred seventy games in the season. <laughs> so uh, it was one of those like we're so bad that you can't get worse. And then so that that kind of like I think feel like something flipped where guys were like, you know what, like what's the worst? Like what's the worst that could happen? You lose. Well, that's already happening. So at least we can get better and while we're losing so that when we do start winning, we can sustain it. It's not just happening. Yeah. So, yeah. So he was like, do you want to close like that day? And then I think from that point on after that save, it was like, you're the closer. And it just happened. Um, Zach Jackson was also hurt at the time who is probably going to close from this year, him or Danny Jimenez uh, for those of you fantasy players. Um, and, you know, Zach is, he's going to pitch five days a week. Uh, He's just, that's the way he's going to be used. So yeah. like, yeah, he, if he were there too, maybe it would have been slower to get back in there. So, but there was like, he was hurt and Danny Jimenez was hurt too. So the two guys they'd been using were both hurt. So we didn't really have one. We were closing by committee. We're just whoever, who any, anyone who can get outs. Um, and at that time it was kind of just, I'm the one who had gotten outs before, even though I hadn't gotten outs really lately, I had the track record. So they're like, you're the highest paid player on the team too. So you got to go out and close. <laughs> and uh, I just said, okay. And then, you know, 21 saves later, it, it was, it was, I don't, that's just, I don't know, something, something flipped, like I said, and it, it just started happening. So, but that game, that one and the other one, the second one, I got to say, get the save in both, just two of the best uh, memories I'll have of my, of my playing career for sure. Awesome. Well, Trevor, I really appreciate your time. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, got to have you on again sometime. I, a lot more to cover. Um, but congratulations on your career, your retirement, looking forward to seeing what you do on YouTube and social media. And then also with your media role that you have in baseball too. looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anytime. Straight three. He turns it loose. Here's the 0-2. And got him. And the A's get the sweep.